Why does a royal family matter? Why is it so important to this country, David? It is the one continuous thread in our history. Um, uh, I try to explain to people why, uh, there, are there are several ways in which you can understand it, but essentially, and it's the, it is this utter paradox of in, it's English history, it's, it's not British history, it's English history. It's this utter paradox of English history that all the things that we think of as our freedoms, the uh, security of property, the uh, forms of representative government, uh, the uh, rigorous enforcement of law, mm. all happen under monarchy are finally a creation of it, and it is their guarantor. In other words, we are that most paradoxical of things. We are a royal republic. <laughs> As, in fact, um, Prince Charles, uh, King Charles very clearly understood uh, in what I thought was a remarkably good speech, uh, which he gave the sort of invented, like so much of the accession, the invented speech when he met both houses of parliament in Westminster Hall um, and emphasized the the fact we are a parliamentary monarchy. Now, many people think that that's a sort of creation of democracy in the 20th century. It's not. The, it goes back to the very latest, the beginning of the 14th century. In 1308, in a ritual that will shortly be reenacted, that's the coronation and the taking of the coronation oath, in 1308, Edward II was forced to swear an oath that he would obey and enforce the laws that shall be chosen by my people, shall be chosen. That's, it is unique in the history of the English monarchy. In other words, what I want, what I think is important about the, the monarchy is that it shows that freedom can be historically rooted, that it's part of a tradition that it is not a product of the 19th century, that it is not a product of democracy, that it is not a product of revolution, that it's not a product of a bill of rights, although all of those things at certain points enter into the story. The thing that finally guarantees freedom in Britain, extraordinarily, isn't the revolution of the 17th century, it is the restoration of a monarchy. And this is the wonderful paradox of English history. Do you think that, no, that in other words, I'm saying our history is the monarchy. That's mm. why I wrote a book called Crown and Country, which is a history of England through the monarchy. It is the institution which reflects us to ourselves. Now, what the relationship of that is to Charles and Harry and the soap opera <laughs> of all of that is anybody's guess. But I'm giving you the high intellectual view yes. of monarchy. Yes. And I think it's one that is, I mean, I'm being desperately serious about it. Because remember, every, particularly this whole new laborish, new leftish uh, university college constitution unit view of political freedom and whatever, that it's all to do with the enlightenment, that it's all to do with written constitutions, but it's all to do with bills of right and sort of doing what more or less a newly enfranchised Eastern European country would set up as its structure of government. I will always gently try to remind people that the average age of a written constitution is about 10 years. That's, they last no longer. The, 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 you know, the fact that, for example, America was able to create a constitution which has endured is utterly unique. There is no other example um, that, that, that compares with that. And of course, it has an enormous downside, as we can actually see at the moment. Um, you, you cement a rigidity, uh, you, you get you know, over the right to bear arms and whatever, you get, you get ex you know, absurd doctrinal rigidity. Whereas a living and constantly revivifying tradition, such as we have or had and should have, mm. I think is the right way to handle human relations. David, you talked about England being this idea. Do you think we can have England without the monarchy? Do you think it could exist as a republic or is it going, to, or are those two things incompatible? It, ha it was tried, wasn't it? It was mm. tried in the 17th century. That's exactly what happened. We did abolish the monarchy and we lasted for 21 years mm. and clamored to have it back. <laughs> I mean, repeatedly, uh, the obvious thing was for Cromwell. 
to have, you know, there was a clamour to make Cromwell king. Mm. Um, the 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 sense was that the that the norm couldn't work without the monarchy. Now I suspect that's probably no longer true. I think that the the monarchy has become so much of a formality mm. uh, that you could, I'm afraid, very easily see it vanish. I think it would be a profound error. I think if we did do what we did again in the 17th century, we would discover our absolute vulnerability. We have a, all the things you and I uh, 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 talk about, the, the, the world of woke, the, 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 the awful cesspit of race relations or whatever, these are forces which press very, very heavily on the whole of, of the Western polity. It seems to me your only resource against these things is finally tradition. Um, and I'm now arguing against my younger self. Um, it may be just that I'm getting old. It may just be that my mind is no longer as sharp as it used to be. But I don't think reason is any defense against these horrors. I really don't. I mean, the, in fact, the, the horrors, in my view, uh, demonstrably arise from the reason gone wrong. The, the, uh, the, the, you know, the very fact that, that uh, so much of it's called critical theory. Mm. It's, it's a kind of reason become cancerous. It's, it's a whole series of intellectual movements that, that, as it were, have turned against the metabolism of, of the mind and, and, and of society. And finally, the anchor against them is our traditions of decency, of good sense, of the way in which we do things. And this is what is so shocking, for example, places like Oxbridge, and particularly my own University of Cambridge. Once upon a time, the sheer notion of collegiality, the sheer notion of the relationship between teacher and taught, would have the sheer reverence for learning itself would have acted as a as, as a barrier and a bulwark. But the deliberate attack on these traditions, the destruction within my own lifetime of a sense of collegiality, the absence any longer of common dining, of, of dons who live in, of unmarried dons who give their whole lives to their institution, it means that the barriers of tradition have largely vanished. There is nothing but reason, self-advancement and whatever, and we can see how totally inadequate they are. You know, you go back to my own case, um, a college, for a mere moment of thinking, oh, this is a bit of a problem, throws somebody who has been involved in it at a very high level and doing a great deal of good for it for 50 odd years, simply aside like a soiled tissue. Now, that represents, in my view, moral corruption. That represents the abandonment of decency the things on which we really depend. Reason, 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 I'm sorry, isn't much for protection. Look at the French Revolution itself mm -hmm. and the, 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 the absurdity of the, the goddess of reason, who's, who's some half-naked actress um, for, from the Comédie Française performing on the altar of Notre Dame. Um, uh, it's, it's why Burke you know, pushes reason to one side. Reason can very easily go mad. It's a rootedness of behavior and a rootedness of political institutions. And one of the things that most worries me about what's happening in Britain is the increasing contempt for our political process, which in many ways I share. The, uh, the parliament, which used to be the, uh, a thing of genuine, okay, everybody laughs at parliament and individual parliamentarians, but broadly that sense of, of pride in the thing seems to me to have worn dangerously, dangerously thin. Um, and that worries me because does that, are you familiar with that extraordinary story of Churchill at the beginning of the First World War? He takes a young man late at night. They're wandering around the Palace of Westminster, as indeed I was last week, the small hours. And they wander into the chamber of the House of Commons, dark, two lights flickering, 
I suppose, maybe electricity, maybe gas at that point. And Churchill invites this young man to look. He says, pointing to the empty House of Commons, this is why we're going to win. Now, would anybody be confident about doing that now? That confidence in the tradition of, we were talking about the Oxford Union, that which of course models its debating, like the Cambridge Union, on Parliament. Does anybody any longer have confidence that what goes on in Parliament represents a genuine discussion by debate? And I think this is an utter, utter tragedy. Um, and it leaves us profoundly vulnerable, that, that without that security of tradition, you have very little.